Hi, my name is Richard, and I'm just a normal guy. I'm married with two kids. Today my kids are pretty mad at me. They both had a field trip, and I didn't let either of them go. All their friends were going, and I still decided not to let them go. They may not have understood why, but my wife did. And now you'll understand why I didn't let them go. Several years ago, when I was still in high school, we had a field trip that turned out to be the scariest experience of my life. It was a sunny fall day, the kind of day when you don't expect anything to go wrong. We were taken into an ancient forest, seemingly harmless, with narrow paths and tall trees that blocked most of the sunlight. The cool air and the crunching of the dry leaves under our feet created an environment that should have been peaceful. But, as is often the case, appearances can be deceiving. At the beginning, the trip was completely normal. We knew the tour guide, Mr. Ford, so my parents trusted him to take us on the trip. Once we got there, the school bus pulled into the forest, and Mr. Ford went to run some errands at the ranger's cabin. That's when the weirdness started to happen. After a few minutes of just standing around doing nothing, the tour guide came back, but this was not Mr. Ford. The tour guide was an older man with a cold and distant look on his face. He seemed very demanding and professional, though not very good with children. Listen, guys. Mr. Ford's not feeling well, so he asked me to be his replacement. You can call me Mr. Ashford. I was a guide for a long time, and even though I don't work with kids from your school, everyone here knows me. What happened to Mr. Ford? Health issues. Nothing any of you would be interested in. Now I need you kids to listen to one more thing. We will continue with the trip as long as you listen to everything I tell you to do. Understood. With that said, the trip continued. Mr. Ashford took us deeper into the forest than we had originally planned. As we moved on, I noticed that the atmosphere was getting thicker and the feeling of being watched came over me. I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just my imagination, but something in the air wasn't right. As we moved deeper into the forest, I noticed that some of my classmates seemed uneasy, as if they felt the same way I did. Ignoring the uncomfortable feeling, the guide led us to a more secluded area, away from other groups exploring the same area. It was then that I saw him for the first time. Among the trees, a lone man dressed in rags with disheveled hair was just staring at us. His gaze was intense, almost predatory. When the guide saw him, he simply greeted him as if he were an old friend and walked on ignoring the puzzled looks of the students. We continued our march, but the discomfort persisted. We felt his eyes on us. He didn't look like a simple lost hiker or a friend of Mr. Ashford's, but since he knew him, we all trusted him blindly. As we moved on, the guide led us to a clearing in the forest where we decided to take a break. We sat on fallen logs while he told us about the history of the place. As he spoke, my eyes couldn't help but search for the strange man, but he was no longer in sight. We decided to resume our walk after a brief pause. It was then that things took a darker turn. As we walked, the guide became increasingly incoherent in his explanations, as if he was losing his mind. He would laugh to himself and make jokes that were totally out of place and made no sense. It was as if he was someone else. Suddenly, the guide stopped and gave us a very strange order. Well, guys, from now on, you'll have to look for the focal point. What's that? Ha! <laughs> you guys look for something out of the ordinary in the forest without going too far. Sooner or later, everyone will find it. No one understood what he meant, but we obeyed. That's when strange things started to happen. My classmates began to disappear one by one. Muffled screams echoed through the forest, but when we tried to locate the source, we found nothing but shadows in the trees. When there were only a few of us left, I finally saw the man in rags again. He materialized out of the underbrush with a sadistic smile that chilled my blood. 
The man had an axe in his hands and was slowly approaching us. We started to back away in fear, but suddenly we were confronted by the guide, who now seemed completely unhinged. They both looked at us with merciless eyes, enjoying the palpable fear that was in the air. We tried to flee, but we were surrounded. It was then that I understood what was happening. These two men were together. Everything the guide had told us so far was a lie. An elaborate lie to get us safely off the trail. Suddenly, the two men rushed towards us, grabbing a teenager each. Some of us wanted to fight, but we were no more than fifteen years old, and no one dared to stand up to them. We ran and ran. Some of us started to get lost, and then we heard their screams in the forest. They chased us through the forest faster and faster, with unhinged laughter echoing all around us. My lungs burned, my legs trembled, but I couldn't stop running. The forest seemed endless, as if we were trapped in a hellish maze. Finally, when we were on the verge of exhaustion, they cornered us in a dark clearing. They surrounded us, laughing with blood-chilling malevolence. The nightmare reached its climax when the guide, with crazed eyes, began to talk about rituals and sacrifices. Haven't you found the focal point yet, children? The focal point is in the center of your breasts. It's where your heart is, and soon everyone will be able to see it. We will rip it out of your chests and show it to you before we give you to the forest. We all began to cry. We all felt that our last hour was coming and there was nothing we could do to avoid them. But it was then that I made a desperate decision. While the guide and the man were still talking about what they were going to do to us, I quickly slipped through a small space between the trees and ran as fast as I had ever ran before. I didn't look back. I didn't think of anything but escaping from that horror. I ended up back at the hut where it had all started. I opened the doors and desperately looked for help. And that's when I found a familiar face. It was Mr. Ford, brutally butchered. I fell to the floor and vomited. I never thought I would come across such a scene. I opened the door and ran, everywhere, totally lost and bewildered. Fortunately, I managed to find help from a group of hikers who were in a busier part of the forest. We called the police, but when they returned to the place where the nightmare took place, they found no trace of the perpetrators or my missing classmates. They were never heard from again. Today, the relatives are still looking for them. But after the story I told them, they lost hope. Many have asked me if the screams I heard were those of their children. It was really very difficult to distinguish them. Today, I'm old enough to be able to think about what happened to me without crying. But you know what? It scarred me for life. As I told you before, I will never let my children go on any field trip when I'm not there to take care of them. Every person who has been to school was taken on a field trip at least once in their entire school life. Mostly the field trip is said to be for educational purposes, but we all know that it's just a fun trip with your friends. But if you have friends like mine, things can go very, very wrong. This incident took place in the early 2000s when computers, mobile phones, and the internet were new things. People were fascinated with them, as well as wary of all things that they entailed. My parents worked in an accounting office, and even though they used computers occasionally, I didn't know much about them. That summer, our field trip was declared. Our school was taking us to a farm a few towns over, and we were supposed to learn animal husbandry and dairy product making. But that was the least interesting part of the trip. The best part was the fact that we'd be getting an overnight stay. I was around 11 back then, and so were all my friends. Our school didn't have many students, and the final count for all the students going was 56. One amongst us was Zach, 
and his father worked in computer software or something like that. That's why he was the only one who had a computer in his house. I kid you not, the whole class, including me, was a bit jealous of him as he used to brag about finding answers to his homework on the internet and playing online games. But the worst thing the boy had discovered was early access to the dark web. Although back then, the dark web wasn't as messed up as it is today. It was mostly a place to download unlicensed applications and purchase illegal stuff. Zack was a horror fan, and he had joined on a dark forum of witchcraft a few days before our trip and used to tell us things that he learned on the forum. A day before the trip, he convinced a few of us to perform a seance with him on the field trip. We were young and foolish and didn't know any better, so we agreed. On the day of the field trip, Zack let us know that he had brought all the stuff we'd need for the ritual, and all we had to do was sneak to a quiet spot on the farm at night and do as he said. We reached the farm, and the day went by in a blink of an eye. We had so much fun petting the farm animals and seeing how dairy products were made. To give us the most out of our trip, our sleeping arrangements was made in an old barn. It had beds, restrooms, and everything we would need. But the barn had an old, rustic look about it. Just behind the barn was a large storage area that had the tools and supplies required to run and maintain the farm. While we were touring the farm earlier, we spotted that a large portion of this storage shack was empty, meaning there was enough space for us to perform the seance. That night when everyone went to bed, the teachers as well as the staff working on the farm had left us alone. Me, Zack, and three of our friends had snuck out to the storage shack with our stuff. Zack had written the steps of the whole ritual on a paper, and we were all sitting in a circle holding hands with candles lit all around us. Zack had placed the paper in front of him, and he had started singing some chants. Basically, our goal was to communicate with any spirit or any entity in our vicinity. Several minutes after we had started the ritual, Zack was still chanting his spells, but nothing significant was happening. Our backs and legs were hurting, and that was about it. Zack was so engrossed in the chanting that he didn't notice our discomfort. Some of us wanted to just leave the ritual and go to bed, as nothing was happening. Even more time passed, and we started to doze off. But Zack continued. He had full faith in the ritual, but we had all lost ours. Just when I was about to break the circle and walk back to bed, the flames of all the candles blazed higher, and a bright orange hue was cast around the shack. Now, we were all on full alert, and Zack was smiling like a lunatic. He was happy that the ritual had worked, and before we could react, one of the candles which was too close to a stack of hay blazed once again, lighting the hay on fire. The big bundle of hay caught fire, and soon it reached the low wooden ceiling in the shed, lighting it on fire as well. Immediately, we knew that the whole shack would be up in flames. All four of us got up, ready to run back to the barn and get in our beds. But as we all got up, Zack just sat there, still smiling at us like a lunatic. We tried to pull him up with us, but he wouldn't budge. He just sat there amongst the rising smoke and flames, smiling. I was the last one beside Zack. The smoke was already getting into my lungs, but I didn't want to leave him behind. But Bruce, one of my friends, pulled me out of the shack leaving Zack seated on the floor. We got back into bed, but I couldn't sleep or even lay still. I was so scared that I was shivering. Soon we heard commotion outside and found all the staff working on the farm gathered around the shack, trying to contain the fire by putting buckets of water on it. Soon our tour guide came into our barn and yelled at us to get up and evacuate immediately. We were taken to the other side of the property, far away from the rising fire. Even though almost 15 people were constantly throwing water at the small shack, the fire was only increasing, and we could all see the orange-red flames rising towards the sky. Finally, the firefighters arrived, and the fire was contained, and we all kids just watched in horror. The next morning, when everything was a bit settled down, they started investigating the cause of the fire, and under the collapsed ceiling of the shed, they found a burned, dead body of a boy. When our teacher took a head count of the students who were missing, it didn't take them long to find that Zack was the dead boy, 
as he was nowhere to be found on the farm. The teacher started asking all the students if they knew anything about Zack, and due to the fear that our teachers and parents would scold us, neither me nor my friends said a word about the ritual to the teachers. But the fact that Zack willingly burned himself to death was eating me alive. Why would he do that? Our ritual had gone horribly wrong, and we had lost one of our friends to it. Weeks later, the case was chucked up as an accident, and Zack's parents were completely shattered. And we couldn't even tell them why and how their son had died. After that, our school canceled overnight field trips, or any such overnight trips. But I couldn't care less as Zack's sinister smile appeared in my dreams every night. He would try to tell me something, but I always failed to understand. Years passed, and although I'd moved on, I couldn't get over the incident completely. It was still present in the back of my mind. Little things like lit candles or people sitting in circles would trigger my memories. But I could never figure out what exactly happened that night. Until I stumbled upon a dark Reddit group myself. As I explored the group, I realized that what Zack said was a ritual to contact spirits was actually a ritual to sacrifice yourself to a demon. And Zack had done just that. But this discovery left me with even more questions. Why would Zack do that? Was he influenced by something? Did the people in the forum promise him something he couldn't resist? How were they able to influence a kid to do something like that? Did he even know what type of ritual he was performing? Have any of you ever experienced anything like this? Have you ever participated in haunted rituals? If yes, please let me know in the comments section.